We're in a series that we're calling Come and See, and we're going to look at the seven I am statements that are found in John. But last week, Carlos got us started by looking at chapter one, Jesus the Word, and we're going to do the opposite and look at the last chapter today, John chapter 21, and we're going to look at Jesus, the one who restores. But we're going to do that by thinking about invitations. Now, here's my guess. These past few months, certainly this past year, you've received multiple invitations. Some of you may have received an invitation or sent an invitation to a Super Bowl party, to a wedding, an anniversary, a birthday, a graduation. We get invitations all the time. We send invitations all the time. Well, you ever realize that God is regularly sending invitations? One of my favorite invitations comes from Isaiah 55. Check, check that out, you know, before the Super Bowl. Isaiah 55, one, God says, Come, come, all of you that are thirsty, come, buy wine, buy milk, without money and without cost. Come, I'll supply what you need. My guess is many of you are familiar with them. Matthew chapter 11, come, all who are weary, come all who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus invites, right? He's God, he's inviting, he's calling people to come. John chapter one, the name of our series, right? Come and see. Some of John the Baptist's disciples um, hear John say about Jesus, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They stop following John, begin to follow Jesus, and uh, they come and they say, hey, so like, where are you staying? Before we kind of, you know, go full in here, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come, come and see. Interesting, right? And we're going to see today in John chapter 21, all the way on the other end, crucifixion's over, resurrection's over, Jesus appears again to his followers, and he says, come, come. I prepared a meal for you. You come. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John 21. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Don't get nervous. You'll be home in time. John chapter 21. And we're going to see this invitation that gets kind of painful in the middle. But here's my guess. You need it, and I need it, and I know you need it. Because John 21 is the last chapter of the last gospel written by the last apostle as preparation for thousands of years of continuing what Jesus started. The last chapter of the last gospel written by the last apostle. Say, so, okay guys, here's what you need to know. What would you write? We'll follow along and let's see what John writes. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the two sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John in this context, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, but they were not that far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who leaned against, uh, back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, well, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He just said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have room for the books that would have been written. Is that what you would have written? Would you have written something like that? Last chapter, last gospel, last apostle, preparing people to continue what Jesus started for centuries. Would you have written that? I think if we know what's there, we probably would have. Jesus gives an invitation. But you ever notice, when you receive an invitation, it's going to cost you something to receive it. Do you ever realize that? Um, if you're going to a birthday party, it's going to cost you money to buy a gift. If you're going to a wedding, it's probably going to cost you a lot of money to attend the wedding. If you're going to a Super Bowl party, it's going to cost you a side dish or something you've got to take, right? Uh, it may cost you travel, it's go but the, it's going to cost you time, isn't it? You've got to put your agenda on the back burner and this other agenda on the front burner. Boy, receiving an invitation and accepting, it's like hard work. You have to put other priorities ahead of your own. That's how invitations work. God's always saying, come. Jesus is always saying, come. Yeah, but the consequences mean we have to give up some stuff in order to accept the invitation. Well, let's take a look at the two scenes in John chapter 21. And for those of you that are gospel readers, both of the scenes are flashbacks, aren't they? The first one flashes back to something else and the second scene flashes to something as well. They're a little different, but knowing the backstory will show you why they're needed at the end of the gospel. Here's the first one. Jesus invites the disciples and he invites us to community. It's an invitation to community. Now, you may not have noticed this, but let me show you. I put the verse up here. Um, I, I missed this for a long time. And maybe you didn't get it. Maybe you're not as dense as I am and you already got it. But it, there's something really strange in that verse. Let me, let me read it to you. Seven guys are going fishing. That's not strange. Here we go. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Um, so there are seven of them. What does it say? They were together. Period. It didn't say they were together because they wanted to go fishing. They were together because they had nothing else to do. They were together because they were waiting for, they were together, period. They were together. Remember how the ministry started? Jesus calls individuals. He calls them into a community. You ever realize how different those guys are? I mean, Thomas is a doubter. Nathaniel is cynical. Read John chapter 1. Um, 
right? Peter is impulsive and a big mouth. John is reflective and James, they were called sons of thunder and here they are together. And you wanna know something? If you're gonna be together, you've gotta work at being together. I don't mean to make you feel guilty on Super Bowl Sunday, but let me, how many times have you ever said, hey, we need to get together and you never did. Do you know why? Because you have to work at being together. Peter said, I'm going fishing. The other six did not say, what a coincidence, we want to go fishing too. They wanted to be together. So even if they hated fishing, they went fishing to be together. Jesus calls individuals. He calls us to a community. You look around the auditorium, you think about people watching online, people in Quakertown, very different backgrounds, just like these seven guys. Different homes of origin, different values, different political stripes called to community. And if we're going to be together, we're going to have to work at being together. And then something strange happens. They fish all night because that was when you fished back then, right? I know. It, they, we're not thinking about what a fishing rod and a thing and a lure and real. That's not how they fished. These were like professional fishermen, right? They fished the way professional fishermen fished, which meant you had these nets. And you would fish at night because it was cooler. The fish would come up to the surface. And when they were at the surface, I'm not sure if they would chum the waters or not, but they would take the net, throw it. The fish were near the top. They'd catch the fish in the net. At, and during the daylight, it's so hot, fish go deep, you can't do that. So you'd fish at night. And they fished all night and caught nothing. And then somebody on the shore says, hey, how'd you guys do? Those of you that are, you hate that, right? Yeah, we caught nothing. Jesus said, oh, try the right side of the boat. Now you realize like in a boat, there's not a right and a left. Like well, it, it, there's everything underneath. You, try the right side. For some reason they did. I would have said, hey, well, I'm not throwing on the right side. I've been fishing all night. I'm tired. Throw on the right side of the boat. Can't even pull in the nets, right? Now, right about then, I'm guessing, John remembers. John remembers the flashback. You can read it later. Luke chapter 5. Early in Jesus' ministry shows up. The, they're all fishing, right? Peter and Andrew are over here. James and John are over there. Jesus is preaching. They fished all night and they caught nothing. What kind of fishermen? They never catch anything. Fishing all night, caught nothing. They're fixing their nets, mending their nets, cleaning their nets on the shore. Jesus comes up, big crowd following. He's going to preach to the crowd. And so he says, hey, Peter, you know, the crowd's kind of pushing me. I'm afraid I'm going to step into the water. Do you mind if I use your boat as kind of like a little stage? Peter says, no, it might as well be used for something. It's no good for fishing. Jesus gets in it, maybe pushes them out. Peter ties it up. And so Jesus is in the boat, you know, the echo coming off the water, beautiful tranquil scene with nice warm weather, unlike we have these days. And, you know, picture Ocean City with the, on the dock, people in there. And Jesus, when he finishes preaching, maybe Peter heard some of it, didn't understand it. Jesus then says, hey, Peter, let's go fishing. He fished all night, caught nothing. Sun's up now, let's go fishing. Um, in Peter's mind, I don't know what he said exactly. I, I think I know what he was thinking. Look, you stick to preaching, I'll stick to fishing, all right? You don't know how to fish, I don't know how to preach. Um, but for some crazy reason, Peter says, okay, begrudgingly. Rose a little bit, not that far. Jesus, said, oh, here looks like a good spot. <laughs> yeah, sure, teacher. Throws in the net. They can't even pull the net in. They tie it to two boats and drag it to shore. What? The miraculous part of that story to me is, Peter didn't ask Jesus if he wanted a job. I mean, wouldn't you love to have Jesus the fish finder, right? Um, we have to fish 45 minutes a day, right? We go out, hey, here are the fish, throw it in. He didn't do that. What does Peter say? Get out of my boat. Get away from me. I don't know the details of who you are, but I know something about who I am and anybody that can do this, I don't want to be around them. Get out of my boat. Similar incident, right? They fished all night, caught nothing in Luke 5. Fished all night, caught nothing in John 21. Oh, but Peter's reaction is opposite. 
In Luke 5, he says, Jesus, get away from me. In John 21, he puts on his clothes, dives in and swims to shore. He wants to get to Jesus as quickly as he can. Something's changed in Peter. Something big's going on inside Peter between Luke 5 and John 21. In Luke 5, he sees Jesus' righteousness, glory, something about him different, and he's repelled by it. John 21, he spent years with Jesus and he runs to him because he's the only one that could bring forgiveness and healing. Big change, right? Flashback number one. Yeah, but then the story gets really painful. It's an invitation to community. They're fishing, and Peter dives in, comes showing a big change in Peter, right? All that stuff. Yeah, but then the next incident is like surgery, right? There's an invitation to the broken. And as I read through it, it always feels, I haven't had many surgeries in my life. You know, we have two staff members that have recently had knee replacements. That's because we require many hours on your knees praying if you're on staff. No, that's not true. And, you know, I, I don't want to hear about their surgeries. I don't want to hear. I, I want to be far away from pain. Well, you know what? When you read this next episode in Mark and excuse me, in John 21, it feels like surgery. Jesus says, come, guys, have breakfast. He prepared. And isn't that amazing? Here's Jesus, king of the universe, crucified risen from the dead, shows up on the shore. They all deserted him in the garden, remember? Right? He, they all left him. Peter denied him, but they all left him. He's alone. In, he shows up and makes them breakfast. He's serving them. Hey, guys, come and get it. But right after breakfast, Jesus says to Peter, hey, Peter, and he doesn't just say that. Here's what he says. Simon, son of John. What happened to the Peter? What happened to the like, yo, bud? What? Simon, son, his old name and his full name. You know, when you have your full name, it's, it's not good. Right? So here's how I would call from dinner across the street in the playground. Hey, child, come on in for dinner. I, I knew I could keep playing. Charles, I said, come and eat. I could still stay a little bit. Charles Howard Zimmerman, if you don't get in, I knew I had to go then, right? When your old name, full name is used, it's not good. So Jesus uses his old name and his full name. Whatever comes after that, it's not good. Simon, old name. Son of John, full name. So do you love me more than these? Flashback number two. Jesus said to his disciples, and before they went to the garden, that they were all going to desert him and he'd be left alone, arrested, and they're going to take him out and execute him. Peter then says, no way. These other spineless wimps, they may desert, not me. I will die for you. I'm the courageous one in the group. These guys may, I will not. So Jesus says, uh, so Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? They deserted, but they didn't deny. Do you love me more than these? And that stings, doesn't it? Um, and Peter says, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And maybe he's hoping it would be over. Round two. Uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And at that point, you know, Peter's probably one and maybe saying, did I mumble? Did I stutter? Was he focused on, didn't he hear what I said? I'll speak up this time. Um, yeah, I love you. Third time. Oof. Simon, old name, son of John, full name. Do you love me? There's no doubt now. What Jesus is doing is absolutely purposeful. Painfully purposeful. 
In the courtyard, Peter denied that he knew Jesus as he was warming himself at a fire. On the shore, Jesus built a fire. Peter denied that he knew Jesus twice and even cursed Jesus three times. Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You know what the most miraculous thing is? Jesus is still pursuing Peter. I mean, I'd have written him off a long time, right? After one or two of these things, he'd be gone. We can't out sin God's grace. That's good news, isn't it? I know we're trying, uh, but, but we can't. Jesus comes. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Notice Peter does not say, yes, I love you more than that. No, he says, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. See, underneath Peter's sins of a lack of courage, underneath the sins of lying, is the sin he was loving something else, his life, his comfort, his safety, more than he was loving Jesus. That's the problem. So Jesus is going after the sin under the sins. And isn't that true of us? Whenever we say no to Jesus, we're saying yes to something else underneath. There's always a sin under the sins, and that's going to be connected to what we're really loving, what we're really valuing. That's where the problem is. That's what Jesus goes after. But this isn't just an invitation to the broken. This is an invitation to restoration, isn't it? Jesus is restoring Peter. So what does Jesus say? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my lambs. He is recommissioning Peter. You know, often as leaders, certainly as Christian leaders, my guess is even in Peter's mind, here is what we think. We often think because our culture says this and our world says this, right? The best leaders are those with the greatest skill set. The best leaders are those who perform the best. The best leaders are not those that have screwed up. Within Jesus' community, Jesus says, no, Peter, I'm restoring you to ministry, not in spite of your sin, but through your sin. Because when you experience that failure and my grace, now you become a trophy of that grace. And you now can lead in my community because this is a community of grace. It's not a community of skills. It's not a community of performance. It's not a community of, a per of perfection. It's a community of those that have repented and returned. That's what it's a community of. And Peter becomes the greatest leader in the early church because he was the biggest failure not in spite of, but actually through. I read a, an interesting article this uh, past week. Actually, uh, I found it in, in a leadership um, kind of magazine online. And it was about boxing. Uh, boxing used to be good, right? We had a big heavyweight here. I don't know what happened. But now we have MMA, which isn't as good or whatever. But this was, this was an article, current article, written about a fight long, long ago when some of you were young. The fight was between Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney in the 20s. So here's what happened. I, I didn't know this until I read the article. Nobody thought Dempsey could be beat because he was like gargantuan and he hit harder than anybody. Well, Gene Tunney was growing up and Gene was kind of a brawler too. He always wanted to be a professional boxer. He was a brawler. But in the military, Gene Tunney broke both of his hands all of his fingers. He still wanted to be a boxer. He was told by the medical community, told by trainers and such, you're never going to box anymore. Your hands are too fragile. He had to completely change how he fought. Eventually, he, be, you know, he becomes kind of a, a, a technical boxer, right? He's kind of, he's more like Muhammad Ali now, right? He's kind of weaving and bobbing and, and rather than standing there slugging it out. Eventually, he gets a shot at Dempsey. They fight over 100,000 people show up, right? I think it was in Soldier Field in Chicago. And, and that's the one where it has, you know, kind of the long count. You can read about it if you want. Um, 
Gene Tunney beats him. Nobody could believe it. Tunney beat Dempsey. Dempsey's so ticked off, he got beat by this guy. He kept running away from him. He gives him a second fight. Tunney won again. Gene Tunney was interviewed after. And he said, how in the world did you beat Jack Dempsey? And here's what he said. I could never have won the fight if I hadn't broken my hand. I would have stood in the middle of the ring and tried to slug it out with him. I'd have got my butt whipped. But knowing I couldn't do that, I had to change how I boxed. Hmm. If my hands hadn't been broken, I couldn't have won. If I was not broken, I could not have come. That's pretty close to the gospel, isn't it? If you don't know you're broken, you'll never come. If you don't know you're broken, you'll never experience the grace. Huh. That's what's happening to Peter. It's not in spite of Peter's failures. It's through those failures that Peter becomes a leader because the gospel engine is all about his grace making up for our weakness, his grace flooding us and filling us and filling all of the gaps so that now... His glory shines through, not our skills and our performance, right? Remember what Paul says? We've got this treasure in earthen vessel. What happened? You got to smash the thing. You got to break it in order for the light to shine out. That's what happens. As we understand our brokenness, then the glory shines out. Ah, but it ends pretty cool. Here's how it ends. There's actually an invitation to follow. And... It's kind of weird, right? And maybe you didn't notice this. I'll, I'll throw some things in you may not know. Here's how it goes right at the end. Uh, it's painful. For, so you think that's painful. Then Jesus tells Peter now how he's going to die. That'd be good. That's good. Here's how you're going to die, by the way. Jesus said, very true, I tell you. Peter, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and what were you wanting? You go out fishing, you used to do all that. Yeah, but when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands. Someone else address you and lead you to where you do not want to go. People in Peter's day, and Peter knew exactly what Jesus meant. Who had their arms stretched out? Those that were tied to the cross beam of a cross. Where are they being led? To where they're going to be executed, right? They're where they're going to be, that's what Jesus is saying. John even tells us in the next verse. By this, Jesus is telling Peter how he's going to die. Boy, there's grace in that verse, isn't there? I mean, I love that. Let me show you two ways there's grace in that verse. First of all, Jesus says to Peter, you're going to get old. That's good news, right? He's not dying next week. Jesus was just crucified, right? He thought his life was soon going to be snuffed out. That's why it's so dangerous for the disciples to be together. Jesus tells Peter, he's going to live a long time. You're going to get old. That's good news, right? Hey, you're not going to die. In fact, Peter lives more than three decades after this. Now, when John writes his gospel, Peter has been executed. But he gets three more decades. That's grace, right? Oh, yeah, but here's the, here's the best part. Peter, one day, you'll stretch out your arms and people will lead you to where you do not want to go. You know what the message there is? Your denying days are over. You won't get out of the next one by saying you don't know me. One day, your faith will be strong. And when they ask you, do you know him? You will stand boldly and say, I know him. I love him. I follow him and you will die for him. His denying days are over. But just like Peter, he sees John there, and after just hearing how he's going to die, he says, you, well, well, how about him? How's he going to die? Yeah, that's Peter, right? He's still Peter, even after that, right? He gets on, he, well, how about him? And Jesus says, uh, here's the paraphrase from the Greek. 
mind your business. I tell John his story. I tell you Peter's story. You follow me. Invitations are costly, aren't they? You get an invitation, you accept the invitation, you have to put your priorities aside. Costly, you have to, you know, come with a gift, you have to take something to a Super Bowl party or a birthday anniversary. And Jesus says, hey, come. It's costly. You don't have to pay for the forgiveness. You don't have to pay for the restoration. You do have to pay by putting your priorities behind his and you follow him. Invitations all through the Bible. This morning, an invitation from Jesus to you. Online, Quaker Town here. Come. Do the smart thing. Accept the invitation. It'll be costly. There'll be no regrets into eternity. Let's pray. Father, my guess is that no one in this room, online or in Quakertown, would have written the last chapter of the last gospel by the last apostle the way we just read it. But boy, it's just what we need. We're going to screw up and fail from here to home. But we can't out sin Jesus' grace. We can't out sin Jesus' pursuit of us. Lord, help us through our failures to accept the invitation again and to follow. And Lord, like Peter, help our denial days and doubting days to be behind. Help us to faithfully follow. After all, Jesus put us first. Now asks us to put him first. We pray in his name. Amen.